Hello and welcome. You're watching Beyond World is One with me and Anya Datta. Let's get started with the headlines. It's time to step back from the brink, says UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres after Iran's attack on Israel. UN chief tells the Security Council that people in West Asia are faced the danger of a devastating full-scale conflict. The Israeli military releases video it said short strikes against Hezbollah weapons manufacturing sites and military compounds in Lebanon in response to the launches that were fired towards northern Israel overnight. UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron claims Iran has suffered quote-unquote double defeat after its attack failed on Israel. US President Joe Biden is set to host Iraqi Prime Minister Shia al-Sudani amid rising tensions in the West Asia region. Biden and Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin are both expected to address the U.S. troop presence in meetings with the Iraqi Prime Minister. After leading the nation for two decades, Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong to step down on May 15th. Deputy Prime Minister Lawrence Wong will be sworn in as the next Prime Minister on the same day. Tensions rise in the metals market as the US and UK tighten sanctions on Russia. And lastly, well, number one, Scotty Scheffler lives up to his pre-tournament favorite tag as at the Masters. The American dominates the field with an 11-under to slip on the green jacket for a second time in three long years. For decades now, Iran and Israel have been engaged in a shadow war. Falling short of direct military confrontation, the friction has been characterized by war through other means, proxies, cyber attacks, sanctions and fiery rhetoric. Here's all you need to know about Iran's regional armed network. Now, Iran hopes to leverage its network to move equipment and personnel across West Asia to bolster the country's drive for regional hegemony and remove Western powers. In recent years, Iran has sought to improve cooperation among these forces to form a more united axis of resistance against mutual enemies. The Iran has relied heavily on its axis of resistance, armed groups in Iraq, Yemen, Lebanon, Syria, and others. Now they share Tehran's goals regarding countering Israel and weakening US's influence in the region. As per the conversation, portal Tehran and Tel Aviv have been adversaries virtually since the 1979 revolution when Shah of Iran fled the nation to be replaced by a theocracy. New leader Ayatollah Khamenei broke the former regime's ties with Tel Aviv and quickly adopted a strident anti-Israel agenda. In the decades since, Israel and Iran have inflicted harm on the other's interests. This has included attacks backed by Iran against Israeli interests in Argentina and Tehran's backing of Hezbollah's insurgency against Israel in Lebanon. 
Meanwhile, Iranian officials have blamed Israel for the killing of senior military officials and scientists related to Iran's nuclear program. The conflict between the Axis and its enemies had remained limited for years. Even though Iran funds and supports the Axis, other countries have often treated its member groups as dis distinct from Iran. Attacks by Hamas or Hezbollah usually did not lead to reprisals against Iran. Recent events in West Asia have changed the nature of Israel-Iran friction. On Saturday, Iran responded to an Israeli strike, alleged Israeli strike on its Syrian consulate by crossing a line it had to date not crossed, launching a direct attack on Israeli soil. The Iranian salvo against Israel is raising fears that a regional war will engulf West Asia. Israeli officials were quick to promise a robust response to the attack and the country has an array of retaliation options. Israel can bank on aerial operations using fighter jets and drones, long-range missile hits and submarine launch strikes. The Israeli war cabinet is set to favor hitting back but divided over when and how. Now, Israel has been in a perpetual state of conflict since its inception, fighting a war almost every single decade. However, the Israeli Air Force would be challenged by a major long-range attack against Iran. As per the national, a major long-range attack against Iran would be a complex operation involving aerial refueling and long flying hours, placing strain on the crew. In such a scenario, Israeli aircraft would need to face Iran's dense air defences and underground military and nuclear facilities. A fleet of aging air-to-air refuelling tankers is another potential concern. Israel's F-15 fighter jets are priced multi-role assets that have been significantly upgraded over the years. The F-15 boasts of an impressive undefeated combat record. However, some available routes for hitting targets in Iran are about 2,000 kilometres one way. The distance to Iranian targets gives the F-15 little time to carry out missions before having to return to base, even with additional external fuel tanks. The F-35 steel technology allows Israeli pilots to carry out top secret missions without tipping off the enemy. Within 20 seconds of takeoff, a team can see the route data of the jet, letting the pilot fly at his or her best while knowing that they have got support on the ground. External fuel tanks can jeopardize stealth aspects of the aircraft, although there are claims that Israel has designed stealthy fuel tanks. The weight of external fuel tanks also limits bomb loads, which are vital if Israel wants to damage underground Iranian drone sites or nuclear facilities. The Israeli Navy currently operates at least five modern diesel-electric Dolphin-class submarines. However, Israel's Dolphin-class submarines can only carry a few missiles, massively limiting a counter-strike. Last but not the least, the option of long-range missile hits. The bulk of Israel's arsenal consists of shorter-range tactical systems, but it also possesses long-range ballistic missiles. The Jericho series for strategic deterrence. The Jericho 2 is a medium-range solid-fueled ballistic missile. As per the Center for Strategic and International Studies, it has a range of 1,500 to 3,500 kilometers. The Jericho 3 is a solid-fueled intermediate-range ballistic missile. It has a range of 4,800 to 6,500 kilometers. Now, to give us more insight, we spoke to Professor James A. Russell, an associate professor in the Department of National Security Affairs at NPS. He joined us from Monterrey. The Israelis have, for many years, uh, adopted a doctrine uh, which, in security studies, we would call conventional deterrence, uh, which is to say they seek to inflict unacceptably high levels of pain on their adversaries. Uh, 
in an attempt to stop any attacks on them. So the question is, if, if they are going to continue with this doctrine of conventional deterrence, what might come next? Um, and as your reporter has just outlined in a very comprehensive report, uh, there are simple geographic limitations to what these two countries can do with each other, which is to say, in most normal interstate wars, you would have countries neighboring each other, closing with one another uh, militarily. And of course, neither country can do that because they're thousands of miles away from each other. The United States assisted Israel in shooting down dozens of drones and missiles fired by Iran on Saturday. It marked the first time Tehran launched a direct military assault on Israel. United States troops are stationed in West Asia for different reasons and except for Syria, they are there with the permission of each country's government. Here's a look at Washington's military presence in the region. Keep covering that flag towards your side! The United States of America has 2,500 troops in Iraq and 900 more in neighboring Syria on a mission to advise and assist local forces to combat the Islamic State. United States armed forces are deployed in Saudi Arabia to protect United States interests in the region against Iran and Iran-backed groups. United States military personnel are also deployed in Jordan to support anti-Islamic state operations to enhance Jordan's security and promote regional stability. Nearly 89 United States military personnel are in Lebanon to enhance counter-terrorism capabilities and support counter-terrorism operations of Lebanese security forces. Approximately 451 U.S. personnel are assigned to or are supporting the United States contingent of the multinational force and observers that have been present in Egypt since the year 1981. U.S. bases are highly guarded facilities, including with air defense systems to protect against missiles or drones. Facilities in countries like Qatar, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait are not usually attacked. But U.S. troops in Iraq and Syria have come under frequent fire in recent years. Since October 7th, U.S. troops have been attacked multiple times by Iran-backed militia, injuring the U.S. troops. The largest U.S. base in West Asia is located in Qatar, known as al Udaid Air Base, and built in the year 1996. Now, the British Parliament is slated to pass a law over the deportation of asylum seekers to Rwanda. However, further legal wrangles can hold up or even derail one of the Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's key policies. While the scheme is set to get lawmakers' approval, the question in focus is whether or not will the policy be implemented by mid-2024, that's this year, as promised by Sunak. The outcome could very well be the deciding factor in the Conservative Party's fate in the upcoming general elections. Sunak has invested huge political capital in the scheme, which will stop illegal migrants from arriving into the UK using small boats. Meanwhile, the UK cabinet remains undecided on the departure of the first flight that would carry migrants to the East African nation. However, UK's health secretary has said that the scheme will be functional within weeks of the legislation's passing. The statement was made even as the government remains short of finding an airline to do so. Separately, in a bid to replicate the scheme, UK has placed four more countries on its radar. These include Armenia, Ivory Coast, Costa Rica and Botswana. United Kingdom has also prepared a reserve list in case any of the four preferred partners drop out of the scheme. These include Cape Verde, Senegal, Tanzania and Sierra Leone. Partner countries are being weighed over criteria 
spanning from availability of land to population size. And as per the deportation policy, which was sketched two years ago, cracking down on illegal entry is vital to deter dangerous cross-channel crossings. Another aim is to neutralize human trafficking networks on the route. Critics, including senior Tory members and Archbishop, have branded the scheme that they are claiming it to be, and I'm quoting, ill-planned and immoral. Human rights and international law have also emerged as two of the strongest concerns around the scheme. Sunak has said that no interference from foreign courts will be allowed, adding that Britain is set to exit the European Convention on Human Rights if needed. This comes after the ECHR blocked the first planned flight for deportation in the year 2022. Till now, only two members have left the ECHR, Greece under military rule in 1969 and Russia after its invasion of Ukraine in the year 2022. Let's now look at the surge in metal prices. The London Metal Exchange saw a spike in aluminum and nickel prices. And this comes as a result of further sanctions imposed by the United States and the United Kingdom on Moscow. The sanctions prohibit the delivery of any Russian supply of metals manufactured after Friday midnight. The metals market are already volatile due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. These additional limitations will only make things worse. The sanctions are meant to limit President Vladimir Putin's military funding. Both aluminum and nickel rose significantly. Aluminum rose 9.4% to hit a level not seen since the current contract's introduction in the year 1987. Nickel surged 8.8%. The dealers expect the removal of a major manufacturer from the market to cause prices to rise. Still, there are concerns over the prospect of a flood of old Russian metal getting dumped onto the exchange. Many dealers and brokers have spent the weekend at work gaming out the market implications of the sanctions. Now, in other news, iPhone maker Apple has denied violating a court order governing its App Store and urged a California federal judge to reject a request by quote-unquote Fortnite developer Epic Games to hold it in contempt. Apple made the arguments in a filing to a U.S. judge who presided over Epic's law suit in 2020, which accused Apple of violating antitrust law with its tight control over how consumers download apps and pay for transactions. While Epic largely lost that case, the court also ordered Apple to give developers greater freedom to guide app users to alternative payment methods for digital goods. Epic said in a court filing last month that Apple was in quote-unquote blatant violation of the court's injunction. It pointed to Apple's imposition of a 27% fee on developers for some purchases which the video game maker said makes links for alternative payment options commercially unusable. Epic also alleged that Apple barred some apps from informing users about other ways to pay for goods. Countering Epic, Apple criticized the game developers' alleged attempt to make its tools and technologies available to developers for free. Epic, the iPhone maker said, wanted the court to micromanage Apple's business operations in a way that would increase Epic's profitability. Let's shift our focus to chess now. India's Vidit Gujarati seems to have the number of world number three, Hikaru Nakamura. The 29-year-old pulled off another upset against the American in round nine of FIDE candidates in Toronto. His compatriot, D. Gukesh, and two-time defending champion, Ayn Nippom Nishi, continue to lead the open category. Now, Nakamura entered the prestigious tournament on the back of a 46-game unbeatable run in the classical time format. Gujarati broke that streak in the second round with black pieces. He repeated the same feat with white pieces on Sunday and now shares the fourth spot with Nakamura and two others. This was the only decisive game in the men's section. Gukesh played out a dram with the third Indian in the fray, R. Praganandha. 
Now, Gukesh could have had the sole lead, but Nipom Nishin managed to salvage a draw from a losing position against Frenchman Alireza Firuja. Top seed Fabiano Caruana was also held by Nijat Abisov, who complained 